tough group because you all have donuts and hot coffee, and uh, that's like feeding school kids after lunch, you know. You, the afternoon sessions just kind of get laid to waste, so I'm going to do the best I can to uh, entertain you. So, And I have to wait to get a cue from this gentleman. Yep. Oh, I'm on? Yep. All of that's live? Well, okay. Well, I want to thank you again for having me back. I think this is my third year that I've come to uh, Sheboygan and now Plymouth. And I always enjoy coming up here. As a matter of fact, the Sheboygan Plymouth contingent I, is always one of my favorite places now to speak because I get this, this intellectual group that, that shows up in mass to, to, to hear about Abraham Lincoln. And I'm, I'm always excited about that. Uh, and I, I am doubly excited by the fact that you braved the two degrees. I don't know if it was two below or two. All I knew it was a single digit and two below or two is uh, really not much difference. But to come out on such a cold, frigid day, I really appreciate that as well. And I understand that this uh, lecture is being, uh, is going to be broadcast on local access. So I would like to say to those people that are watching this on uh, local access that uh, I hope you enjoy the lecture as well. And I appreciate your viewing, uh, taking the time to view the lecture today. Abraham Lincoln, uh, his birthday is Wednesday. For people like myself, that's the holy high day. And everybody will be congregating in Springfield, Illinois, where they have a large uh, convention every year. And they always have a national speaker that comes in and speaks. And uh, I won't be down there this year. I'm going to celebrate it in Racine. But it's timely that uh, we honor Abraham Lincoln again. We, we passed his 200th birthday in 2009. He's not getting any younger, but we certainly continue our fascination with him. And for those of us that live in Wisconsin, it's interesting for us to periodically remember that Abraham Lincoln was in our state twice. And Mary Lincoln was in our state twice. But they were never here together, and they were never here in the same year. Abraham Lincoln's visits to our state both took place before he was president of the United States. And Mary Lincoln's visits to our state took place after her husband had been killed. So we really have four distinct stories of Lincoln visits. And they're all different, and they were all made for different reasons. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to see if I can navigate through these stories and kind of give you a capsule history of why they were here, what they did here, what they may have said here, and how we remember the Lincolns today. It's easy for us to know Lincoln was here for, for a couple of reasons. One, if you go around the state of Wisconsin, there's no shortage of Lincoln monuments and Lincoln statues. In fact, does anybody know how many Lincoln statues there are in the state of Wisconsin? Anybody want to take a guess? Nine. We have nine statues to Abraham Lincoln in the state of Wisconsin. Now that's pretty significant when you think of other states who have none or a few. And he only lived in three states. He lived in Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois, and then of course Washington, D.C. There is virtually now no state that does not have a statue of Abraham Lincoln or a monument of Abraham Lincoln, which is quite interesting given the fact that he never even was in all in those states. And some of them weren't even states, they were still territories. So you can go to Iowa, you can go to California, you can go into downtown LA and find a head of Abraham Lincoln. Now I tell this story, it's more of a reflection on me. But I went to Hawaii in 1988. And what I didn't tell the people I was with was that there was a Lincoln statue over there. And so I rented a car and I went way out to Eva Beach 
on Oahu, and there's a statue of Abraham Lincoln. There's no place you cannot go today that you cannot find something to Abraham Lincoln. It could be a plaque on a wall. It could be the Gettysburg Address in bronze on a school wall. He's everywhere. And I think that's great because we need to see more Lincoln in our country. But we not, not only need to see him, we need to really understand him. He's a complex character. And that's why I think he remains such an enigma in our collective imagination as a nation, because he is so complex. But in our collective knowledge of what we think we know about him, we reduce it to sound bites and talking bites on news shows, and we think that we've kind of condensed what he said and what he was about into a few things that, that you know, we remember him saying or doing. And that is such a superficial way of handling him that the more you read and the deeper you understand about that era in American history and what he dealt with and the obstacles he overcame from youth to you know the time that he was president makes him a a fascinating figure much more fascinating and I continue to read about it you know I have people kid me all the time you know do you ever learn anything new oh yes <laughs> all the time. Now the other day I just started reading a two-volume Life of Lincoln that came out five years ago by my friend Michael Burlingame. It's a two-volume. Each volume is about 700 pages. And I'm going through it. Now I don't, I don't speed read. I never took Evelyn Wood. I, I labor at reading. I'm a great reader, but I, I read for facts, you know, so I'm reading and reading. I read every word, you know, ooh. and I found out that there were three words that Abraham Lincoln consistently misspelled throughout his entire life. <laughs> now, that wouldn't really excite anybody but me, and I was having a Lincoln High moment because, <laughs> and I had to share it with the people in the room. There were three words, did you know that, that Abraham Lincoln consistently misspelled? And he told people how he would write these words. And one, one of the words was maintenance. One of the words was opportunity. And the other word was very. Because he used to always spell it with two R's. This is going into the presidency. He says, I never knew. I was misspelling the word very. And Lincoln, being such a simply honest man, had absolutely no problem telling people what his deficiencies were, whether it was his education, whether it was his spelling, whether it was misreading some situation. He would tell you, oh yeah, can you believe that I did that? I've been doing that for 50 years. And there's absolutely no sort of self-importance that he ever gave to himself. Can you imagine a president today saying, you know, I've been misspelling the word very for about the last 25 years. In maintenance and opportunity. Oh my. But you see, I, I learn these things and it makes my day. And you're laughing because I can tell you, I'm making your day right now. You're learning stuff today. That's good. But Lincoln and Wisconsin, I always tell people, my digressions are far more fascinating than my topics. Believe me, they are. So, but I'm back to Lincoln and Wisconsin. You can't go anywhere. You can go to the State Fair Park in Milwaukee. Abraham Lincoln's on a bronze plaque between four cedar trees. You can go to 13th and Wells in Milwaukee, and there is a plaque on a boulder next to the sidewalk. 13th and Wells. How many people have ever gone to Milwaukee and driven by 13th and Wells? What happened at 13th and Wells? Abraham Lincoln spoke at that spot at the Wisconsin State Fair in 1859, the only address he ever gave on agriculture. He was trying to be a noted lecturer and he was bad at it. He was a gifted rhetorical public politician but when it came to giving lectures, and he actually had a couple of lectures that he went out and kind of tried on audiences. He had one favorite that he ended up doing in two parts called Discoveries and Inventions. And he tried to give a lecture on how discoveries and inventions were part of 
humanity and which inventions were significant and in his mind, you know, which ones were giving progress to man and all of that. It's a very uninteresting lecture. He tried it at least on two occasions and it just fizzled. But get Lincoln to talk about slavery? Get Lincoln to talk about a social ill? Get Lincoln to go and, and talk somewhere about uh, an issue of the day? Audiences were enraptured. My favorite story of Lincoln, again, it has nothing to do with Wisconsin, but he spoke here, so I'll tell you this. He had to speak out east. He was invited to speak out east at the Cooper Union. And this would have been a significant speech for Lincoln. First time he ever traveled to the east coast of the United States. He's going to speak in New York, the center of all that is intellectual and knowledge. And he's going to speak in a very fancy auditorium in front of almost every city intellectual on the East Coast. And they invited him, simply because of his reputation as having come out of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And they, they sent a man to meet him at the train. And Lincoln gets off the train. And this gentleman later would write, oh my. Here's this six foot four man in this rack of clothes that's hanging on him, not pressed, wrinkled, kind of looks a little dingy, bow ties crooked, and his hair. I mean, his hair was everywhere. And his ears, these humongous ears, and that nose. And, and they, they saw him, and he gets off the train with this carpet bag, and oh my. And, and the person that met him thought, oh, have they made a mistake? Did they really make a mistake in bringing this man to New York? And that night he went and spoke at the Cooper Union. And he got up, much like I am up here today, kind of in an elevated position. And all the gas jets are burning in the Cooper Union. And all these people in fine suits are sitting there waiting, waiting for him to speak, and they're looking at him. And there were people that were there that night that said, we almost felt sorry for him. He stood there with his nose and his ears and his hair and his clothes. And, and you know, he, he looked uncomfortable. He didn't know where to put his hands. You know, his hands were huge. Um, trivia, based his hands to tips of his fingers, 11 inches. You want to talk about a big hand? And these big hands, and he, he, you know, and Lincoln always says, you know, you want to see a man give a speech like he's fighting off a swarm of bees, you know. So Lincoln's, you know, used to being out on the prairie where he's, you know, walking around and using these gestures, and he had a very high tenor voice. It wasn't deep and baritone like Raymond Massey's. It was really high and squeaky, and it, they said it sounded kind of like a trumpet, but it, it really carried well in, in open air. So here's the guy that's standing before this New York audience. And then he opened his mouth and spoke on slavery, probably for about two hours, because he would go off a, a prepared text. Lincoln did not extemporaneously speak well. So all of the speeches that we have about Lincoln were very well crafted by him, rehearsed by him, delivered by him, and everything was chosen the way you would speak. And so he's going off this prepared text, and he's speaking. And by the time he was done, people were throwing their you know, stuff in the air. It was almost like a political convention. They were throwing things in the air, standing up, hugging one another, you know, just cheering this man on and on and on and on. And they're milling out now into the street after the lecture's over. And people are cheering in the street, having just spent two hours being absolutely mesmerized by him. And, and two people are in the street, and the one said to the guy that met him, at the train. What do you think of old Abe the rail splitter now? What do you think of him? And this man who met him, having only heard him speak once, said, he is the greatest character since St. Paul. 
His secretary said he is the greatest figure since Christ. Can you imagine to have worked with somebody like that or to hear someone speak one time and say he's a great, as great as St. Paul? And, and that's where I think it would be f so fascinating to go back in history and listen to Lincoln speak, to be sitting there mesmerized. How often do we get mesmerized by anybody today when we watch somebody on the television or in person? In Bloomington, he gave a speech one time. He mesmerized the reporters to such a degree, a table of reporters, all supposedly to take this, this speech down in shorthand. He mesmerized even the reporters to the extent none of them took a note. <laughs> Can you imagine? None of them took a note. It's called Lincoln's Law Speech. They got to the end of it and everyone was looking at each other. Did you take a note? No, I didn't take a note. Did you take a note? I was listening to the man. You know. We lost the speech. In 1832, Abraham Lincoln comes the first time into our borders. He came in as a 23-year-old militia man who had enlisted in the Black Hawk War. And he enlisted in that war because, as he said at the time, I had nothing better to do. So if you think that he was coming here because he had some ideas of heroics or he was trying to build a military record or he was, you know, he came here, my friends, because he, one, was broke and two, he had no job. And when it broke out, when the war broke out or the Indian skirmish broke out, I don't think you can really call it a war, but there was an Indian uprising, if you want to call it that, and the governor had called for volunteers in Lincoln, you know, as he said later, I had nothing better to do, so I volunteered. And he uh, was mustered into service, and the, the, the gentleman that mustered him into service, that enrolled him, of all things, was Robert Anderson, who would surrender Fort Sumter. And it would be Robert Anderson who, four years later, would raise the flag at Fort Sumter on the morning of the day Lincoln was assassinated. So Robert Anderson mustered Lincoln into service in the Black Hawk War in our state. And there were some other kind of famous people that came out of the Black Hawk War that Lincoln was in. There was uh, John Todd Stewart, who would be the cousin of Mary Todd. And that was his connection with the Todds. Jefferson Davis was in the Black Hawk War. And it doesn't appear that Lincoln ever met Davis or knew of him, but he certainly would know of Davis later in Congress when they both served in Congress together, and he would just call him Jeff, you know, <coughs> Jeff. Lincoln would go through three enlistments, and he really didn't do much in the Black Hawk War except march, 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 march through swamps, march through, and, and they would hear, you know, Black Hawk's over here, he's been sighted, and, and everybody would be, you know, now we have to march over there. So you'd march here. Oh, no, you know, now we heard he's over here. And then they'd march over there. So he did a lot of marching. Um, his, his service in the Black Hawk War was very uh, un, undistinguishable from anybody else that would have been in the war at that time. We know of a few instances that happened to him. One time, he, he was in charge of a real uncontrollable group of guys, some of whom came out of his own village of New Salem. And they all elected him captain in New Salem. So he was captain of his own troop. And he would say throughout the rest of his life that his election <clears throat> as captain in the Black Hawk War gave him more satisfaction than any election had given him afterwards. And I think that was because you know, he, he was with his own people, had earned the respect of his own people, and they had elected him captain. And they were all hard drinkers and rather uncontrollable, whimsical, bombastic personalities. So for fun, rather than foraging for onions in fields like Lincoln would have to do often to find something to eat, they would uh, forge into the quarters of where the liquor was kept and uh, all of them would pretty much get snockered and, and Lincoln would inherit this problem of having his troop being pretty drunk and he would have to pay the penalty for that. So he was made at one point to carry a wooden sword for three days. 
And on another time, he, he claimed he bent a musket. Now, we don't know how he bent that. But he bent a musket. He was made to carry a wooden sword. Um, we do know that at one point in these enlistments, the uh, Lingen was faced with a dilemma. And that was that an Indian had come into camp with a legitimate pass to see Lincoln superior. Now, these 20-year-old men, you know, they were fighting Indians. They hadn't seen any Indians. And now they have an Indian in their camp. And of course, the inclination was to do away with this Indian. I mean, we're here to kill Indians, let's kill him. And Lincoln was the only one who stood up and defended the Indian and said, you know, to his own men and to anybody else who was around, you know, you're not touching this man. And if, you know, anybody thinks they're going to hurt him, they're going to have to come through me. Well, nobody would have had the courage to do that. Lincoln, in, by the time of being 22, 23 years of old, was six foot four, and he was about 180 pounds, and he had these long arms. He was a gifted wrestler, and the people that lived with him in New Salem would see him do feats of strength that we would think of would be almost mythological today, but there are numerous reports of him being able to lift <laughs> A thousand pounds and we have um, a record of him one time uh, somebody wanted a chicken coop moved on his farm and they were trying to round up men to go and move this chicken coop and Lincoln said well that's not a problem went over picked up the chicken coop carried it to where the farmer wanted it and put it back down so we know his strength was enormous so you know, for him to say to a group of men, you know, come on, you want to hurt the guy, you got to come through me. Everybody that knew Lincoln knew he was, he was the wrestler of the troop and he would, they would get into these wrestling competitions with the biggest man from another troop. So he was wrestling a lot and doing that. And, you know, he, he, Lincoln went very far in life because of his size. Don't, don't think that it was all mental ability especially if you read Lincoln's youth, you find that everybody knew he was smarter than everybody else. All the kids that went to school with him knew that he was going to outshine anybody intellectually. But the thing was, they also knew he was going to outshine anybody physically. He could do everything. And, you know, we find in his life various instances where he's faced with a situation where a five foot eight guy like me, now I, I have to say that cautiously because I just recently went to the doctor, they said I'm five five, so I, I, I'm shrinking. I might have been five eight in my prime, but I guess I'm past my prime, so. But, you know, he would have been faced with situations that a five foot five guy probably wouldn't have succeeded in. But he was going to succeed in it. And, uh, so, you know, his enlistments were, were very, mostly it was an average soldier's day. A lot of marching, a lot of drilling, uh, looking for food, um, trying to keep his troop organized. Um, he did meet General Zachary Taylor, who had become president in the Black Hawk War. And he ended up uh, marching toward the end of his third enlistment, because he kept re-enlisting because he had nothing better to do and he was earning a little money. So, he ended up marching as, almost as far north as Fort Atkinson. And if you go into Fort Atkinson, there's the Horde Museum. How many have been to the Horde Museum? Oh, look at the hands, yes. And there's a Lincoln collection in the Horde Museum. And there's a nice, I'll call it a mannequin, it's, it's, it's a figure, a full-size life figure of Lincoln. Actually, it's not Lincoln, it's really Hal Holbrook. It's modeled after Hal Holbrook in the 1976 series on Sandberg's Lincoln. So when you look at him, you're really looking at Hal Holbrook in makeup. But it's the only Hal Holbrook dummy I've ever seen, and we have it here in Wisconsin, right? So we can brag about that. But he was mustered out of service near Whitewater. And there's a sign, there's a billboard. It was there a few years ago. And the, the day after his enlistment ended, his horse was stolen. And he and a friend, also from New Salem, had to get from Whitewater, Wisconsin, down to New Salem, about 20 miles from Springfield. And now I've seen various estimates on that, but 
they only had now one horse. And they, you know, so sometimes one would ride, one would walk. They might have both rode together at some point, and then they stopped when they reached some rivers. They built a boat. They took a few days, built a boat, took the tributaries as far as they could until they ran out of water. And, and I've heard that it took six months for them to get from Whitewater, Wisconsin to New Salem, a distance of, let's say, 350 miles. You think of that today, and you think, oh, that's, you know, that's nothing. But he, he was running for the state legislature at that time, and he arrived back in New Salem just too late, really, to campaign, and he lost, simply because he wasn't there to campaign, really. And years later, in 1848, he was giving a message to Congress. He's a congressman, and the Democrats were putting up a man by the name of Cass as a military hero. So this idea of calling attention to your war record was very, very popular. And the Democrats on the House floor were really boasting about Cass's war record in the Mexican War. And uh, Lincoln got up and uh, he said, did you know that I am also a military hero? <coughs> yes, sir. I fought, bled, and came away. It is, quite uncertain, it is quite certain that I did not break my sword, as they had reported General Cass had done in the Mexican War. It is quite certain I did not break my sword, for I had none to break. But I bent a musket pretty badly on one occasion, and if General Cass went in advance of me of picking huckleberries, in his foraging for food, evidently, I guess I surpassed him in advance of, in charges upon the wild onions. And if he saw any live fighting Indians, it was more than I did. But I had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes. <laughs> and although I never fainted from loss of blood, I can truly say I was often hungry. And I protest that they shall not make fun of me by attempting to write me into a military hero. So you see Lincoln not trying to do any attempt to say, look at my war record or look at what I have been involved in. He would ridicule himself frequently for that. And, and also when, he, there, when the campaign biography started coming out in 1860 when he was running for president, you know, they wanted to have campaign biographies that people could read. Who is this man? What is his background? And the biographers would come to him. You know, we, what can we say? And he says, oh, no, you, you, you can't make anything of my early life. He says, it, it would be foolishness to try to make anything out of my early life. It can all be condensed into one statement, and that you will find in Gray's Elegy, the, the, the short and simple annals of the poor. And that's all you or anybody else can ever make of my early life. And that's all he would ever say about it. When you talk about somebody being in abject poverty, the Lincolns were in abject poverty. They, they were as dirt poor as you could be. And Lincoln, almost when a child, you could almost describe to him that popular saying, root hog or die. Because these children almost, at some point, were almost feral. No, there, there was absolutely nothing that Lincoln thought of in his early life that was worthy of even mention, much less trying to impress somebody. No education, you know, no land, no holdings, no family, no name, nothing. And he says, and don't try to make it into something. Don't fabricate something. Don't sugarcoat anything. Leave it the way it is. Because the way, the way it is is the way it was. That's the truth. And that's all you and anybody else can do with it. Boy, that biographer must have had a field day, hey? But in 1859, just 30 years later, uh, 20 years later, Lincoln gets invited to come and speak before our state fair. 
And the state fair was always held in the fairgrounds, which were down at 13th and Wells at that time in that area. That was all rural. And Lincoln would speak from the top of a wagon. And they asked him, you know, would you come and speak? Well, this was a year after the Lincoln-Douglas debates. The whole nation by now knew of Abraham Lincoln because the Lincoln-Douglas debates were actually covered in the press. So the way we were reading, for example, the updates on the O.J. Simpson trial, and we were all glued to what was going on possibly in the, in, in the Clinton scandals in the 90s. Remember how everybody was just glued to the television and glued to the, the newspaper? What's the next piece that's going to come out on these, these various stories? That's exactly the way all of America was looking at the Lincoln-Douglas debates. They were transcribed and written down and telegraphed three-hour debates telegraphed and they were published in newspapers out east, out west, and so all of a sudden Abraham Lincoln is a national name. And although he didn't um, get the senatorial seat as a result of the debates, he's a very prominent man now. And everybody wants him to speak because anybody that ever heard him speak knew that this was a guy worth having to speak. And so Wisconsin said, would you come and speak? They didn't evidently tell him what to speak on, so Lincoln thought, well, I guess if I'm going to speak at the state fair, I, I suppose I should speak on agriculture. And he did. He, it's the only address that he ever gave on the subject of agriculture. It's, again, not, not the most enchanting speech that you will read out of the Lincoln uh, canon, but uh, Abraham Lincoln had... Uh, some, th some things to say. He was talking about how the farmers as a class, uh, you know, are looked upon and, and have a great reputation. And he's talking about some of the technologies again, incorporating some of his information from discoveries and inventions. You know, how the steam plow will help and, and how farmers can look for new technologies and how to work the land and how to do um, various improvements with their crops. But he gets to the end of the speech. And the way he summed up the speech, and this actually comes out in the Raymond Massey film, Abe Lincoln in Illinois. They stuck this at the, anybody remember the Raymond Massey film? The end of the film, he's on the train, remember? And he, they say, say something, Abe, say something, Abe, and he gets up and he starts going into his farewell address, so-called. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the farewell address, all these other little Lincoln sayings come in. It's not the farewell address that we know it because they took all these little statements that Lincoln had made and they kind of stuck them in the farewell address, although he didn't say them there. They stuck this from the Wisconsin State Fair speech into the farewell address. And Raymond Massey said them. He says, and it, it is said, an Eastern monarch once charged his wise men to invent him a sentence. To ever be in view, in which should be true and appropriate in all times and situations. They presented him with the words, quote, and this too shall pass away, unquote. How much it expresses, how chastening in the hour of pride, how consoling in the depths of affliction, and this too shall pass away how much it expresses. And yet let us hope that it is not quite true. Let us hope rather that by the best cultivation of the physical world beneath and around us and the intellectual and moral world within us, that we shall secure an individual, social and political prosperity and happiness whose course shall be onward and upward in which while the earth endures, shall not pass away. And that's how Lincoln ended his speech in Wisconsin. He then got invited, while he's in Milwaukee, to speak to Beloit and to Jay Anna Janesville. Now he hadn't planned on going there, but they had approached him representing Republican clubs in those two communities, and they said, would you come and speak to us? And Lincoln says, well, you know, I'm really supposed to go back you know, to Springfield, because he was a practicing lawyer. He was, he was still taking care of his, his client base, and, and they said, well, please come, and we'll put you up uh, in Janesville. So we have the only house that Abraham Lincoln ever slept in, stayed in, is in Janesville, the Tallman House. It's 
So for those of you that go to the Tallman Restorations, as they call them today, uh, Lincoln spent a night in that house, and he was the guest of William Tallman. And he came, and you can imagine Lincoln coming into that house with marble tops and indoor plumbing and marble sinks and these formal parlors. Now, Lincoln was already living in his home in Springfield, but the Tallman house would have just made Abraham Lincoln's house look very, very modest. And um, a couple of interesting things come out of that. One is uh, he was uh, in the parlor with Mrs. Tallman, and they were having dinner, and um, he, he looked very uncomfortable. And, and, they, and he asked Mrs. Tallman, would, would you mind if we went and sat in the other room? Can you imagine saying that to your host, hostess? Would you mind if we went and sat in, in this other room? And, the, and she said, well, of course, Mr. Lincoln, you know, we can go sit in the other room. Sure, yeah, it'd be great. So they go from this rather formal uh, parlor into this much less formal room. And Lincoln is now at ease. He's not at ease in a formal, stiff, cold parlor. But he was much more comfortable in the more informal environment where he could kind of, you know, just relax. And people noted that. And, and there was a, a gentleman that was there at the time. He was, uh, I believe, 14 years old. His name was Lucian Hanks. No relation to Lincoln's mother's family of the name of Hanks. But Lincoln said, oh, I'm, I'm familiar with that name. Yeah, Hanks, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hanks that night was going to go out to a dance um, with a young lady. And Lincoln kind of teased her a little bit about him being her beau. And uh, they said, you know, Mr. Lincoln, we, we don't have a bed for you. You know, because Lucian was, had his own room there. And uh, Lincoln said, well, that's OK. You know, I'll just sleep with Hanks, you know. We can share a bed. And we think of that today as maybe, you know, something a little bit unusual. That was absolutely not unusual at all in Lincoln's day. Lincoln, when he was on the circuit with this traveling menagerie of judges and lawyers, they would go around these towns and these, these courthouses around Illinois, and you might have had, you know, three lawyers to a bed. There wasn't enough accommodations for lawyers and judges because they didn't have resident lawyers and judges. So these lawyers and judges would go around somewhat like a circus and travel together and go into the next town and try all those cases and they'd have to sleep together, eat together, do, you know, they were maybe on opposite sides of a case. They had to do their, their case preparation on the spot, maybe in a hallway of how they were going to defend a client. You know, it was, it was all very impromptu and they might be there for two days then go on to the next courthouse and take care of all the pending litigation there. And, and Lincoln would often have to spend Nights in these hotels with the worst, the, the lawyers that wrote about it later said the worst food, the worst food imaginable in these inns. And he goes, Lincoln seemed to be completely oblivious. Whether it was good food, bad food, rotten food, delicious food, didn't matter to him. If it was hot and you put it in front of him, he'd eat it. If it was cold and you put it in front of him, he'd eat it. He ate without thinking about it. He was just happy to eat. And, but the, the, the lawyers were the worst food and the worst accommodations. And we had people laying on the floors and everything, you know, three to a bed. And, 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 all, and Lincoln would do this six months out of the year by choice. So for, for Lincoln to say to Hanks, you know, I'll just sleep with Hanks, that was nothing. And Lincoln goes to bed early, he, and Hanks comes back. I think he said he came back about midnight from the dance. And he goes into his room, and he's going to get in bed with Lincoln, and, and Lincoln's already asleep and snoring. And Hanks gets in bed with him, you know, and the, he, they said, you know, if there was anybody that was more active in his sleep than when he was awake, it had to be Lincoln. <laughs> he's walking, he's kicking, he's rolling, his arms are flailing, he's, snor he's snoring. And, and he said, you know, I gave up after a while. I just gave up. And I got up, and I went out into the hallway, and I slept on the couch. I gave Lincoln the bed and, you know, I, I slept on the couch. And the next morning, Lincoln comes out and he comes down, he's late for breakfast, he comes down to the dining room and he, he looks at uh, Hanks and he says, you know, I can't accuse you, but, but I, I don't have any boots. My boots are, you know, missing. And 
and they, oh, and Mrs. Tallman had to explain that in that house, you know, you took your boots off and you put them in the hallway. And then during the course of the night, in early morning, the maids would come, the butlers would come and take everyone's boots or shoes, take them down into the, you know, the servants' areas, polish the boots, and then they'd put them on a rack. So the family's boots were all down in the, in, on the rack. Well, this was unheard of. Getting your boots polished? Wow. You know. So there's little stories like that that came out of Janesville. We don't have texts for the Janesville or the Beloit speeches. We know he spoke to the Republicans, and he probably spoke. There's newspaper accounts that, he, he, you know, that, that they printed about what he said, but there's no direct quotes. But he spoke for about an hour and a half or two hours to each one of those uh, clubs, and he probably had a good canned Republican anti-slavery speech that he would repeat when he would get such invitations. And it probably wasn't much different than what he was giving in Columbus, Ohio, or Holland, Michigan, where he was speaking at that time. It was pretty much the same speech. And then he went back to Illinois. And he never came into Wisconsin again. I think what is interesting about those two speeches is, or those two uh, visits is one, I think Abraham Lincoln, especially in 1832 with the Black Hawk War episode, he gets a really strong appreciation for what it was like to be a soldier. And I think that during the Civil War when he was commander in chief, that he understood the, the importance of having enough blankets, of having enough tents, of having enough rations, of having enough weaponry, that if you're going to put soldiers in the field, you have to give them the tools to do their job. He understood that. He didn't have it, but he understood that. He understood what it was like to be sleeping on, on the ground in the rain. He understood what it was like. I shouldn't say this. He did come upon uh, a, a place of battle, but after the battle had taken place and all the participants had left. He came upon soldiers who had been scalped. They had been killed and they had been scalped. And Lincoln's job was to help bury them. And he would write about the, he'll never forget the, the, the sun, the eastern sun that morning, gleaming down on all of these red, orange, bald spots on these soldiers' heads where they had been scalped. And he helped bury them. You know, he never forgot those things. And he would remember that. And he would remember how it was when he was in the field. It's little wonder that when he would go into the field, like Lincoln did frequently, the only time that Lincoln for the most part ever left the White House was for one of two things. He was either meeting with generals on how to organize or supervise a war, or he was going to visit soldiers as a morale booster. How many remember when George Bush got in his aviator outfit and landed on the aircraft carrier and got out? You remember that? And the soldiers are cheering and all of America's going, yeah, there he is, holding his helmet, you know, and everything. Yeah, that's what Lincoln did. He went out on morale-boosting appearances and the soldiers came. They wanted to see Father Abraham. That's what they called him, Father Abraham, or the old man. They wanted to see him. He would go into the hospitals and shake their hands. Who are you? Tell me your name. I want to know your name. Where are you from? How tall are you? Especially tall men. Oh, you're a tall one. How tall are you? Well, I'm six what? I think I got you beat. <laughs> He'd say somebody, then somebody would say six four. We're going to measure that. You know, they, back to back, you know. Let's say put a book across the top of our head, see which way it tilts. He thought that was great fun. Do you think it was fun for that soldier? To measure backs with the President of the United States? To have the President say, hey, come on, measure back to back. Let's see who's tall here. They never forgot that. These people would have marched for another four years for Father Abraham. The general population in those elections, when they got into year four of the Civil War, Congress, the Senate, the politicians, even the citizenry were asking, how much longer, Mr. Lincoln, how much longer is, are you going to keep throwing bodies at this war? How much longer? Do, do we, does any of this sound familiar? 
How much longer are we going to keep pouring millions into this war? How much longer are we going to have to lose another 20,000 men in 20 minutes in Grant's army? How much longer are you going to keep doing this? And when the elections came, Lincoln did something that was really quite daring. He made sure that all the soldiers could vote. They're the ones fighting. And all of them voted for him. The reason he carried those elections was because they voted for him. While the politicians were screaming against him, even while the families at home were sometimes screaming against him, they voted for him. And when he trounced McClellan in 1864, how many of you remember the election of Nixon over McGovern? The largest election landslide. And it, it was, it's either that one or when Reagan beat Carter. Remember that, 1980? Those are the two landslide elections. Lincoln beat General McClellan, a general that fought in the Civil War. He beat him more badly than Nixon or Reagan beat their opponents. It was a massive victory, both on the electoral vote and on the popular vote. If anybody wants to wonder whether or not Abraham Lincoln was not supported during the Civil War, all you have to do is look at the soldiers. And a lot of that he gleaned from being in our state. No question about it. He knew how to talk to them. And he knew how to relate to them. Now, I'm almost halfway through. So I'm going to take five minutes or less if you don't have any questions. We're going to, we're going to take a... We'll take a 10-minute break, and then I'll come back, and I'll finish up with Mary Todd. Her, her, her uh, visits are actually quite more fascinating. At least I find them fascinating. One, she came into Racine, and I lived there, so I find that fascinating. <laughs> and she was in Waukesha. And uh, she, she had a rather fascinating little visit there, too. So, you know, there, there are different visits and different things. But I'll, I'll just ask, anybody have any questions on Abraham Lincoln's visit? To Wisconsin, yes. His childhood, we always hear it sitting and reading the moral books with the lantern and everything. Is that fallacy? Or no, that that's true. He didn't want anything said about it, or what it was, it was. So. What he meant was he had no formal schooling, he had less than a year of formal schooling, so when people are touting about how they went to school or how they, you know, nobody went to college, but when they talked about, oh, I went to a school and I've, I'm educated, he had none of that. He picked up, he, he would always call his, he would always mark his education as defective in print when he had to fill out something and they'd say, education, defective. Abraham Lincoln was a very good cow milker. <laughs> and he milked a cow even in Springfield in the building behind his home at 8th and Jackson. He milked his own cow. He chopped his own wood. Even when he was a politician and a lawyer. Yes? Yeah, burn it. Next. No. Burn it. Next. <laughs> Well, the Black Hawk War, in essence, was Black Hawk had agreed and had systematically entered into treaties which removed his land from him. And he kept having his land in Wisconsin removed from him in these treaties. And he, had to, he was being pushed further and further west. So by now he's in Iowa. And it was an Indian political thing, but he was starting to lose favor with the Sauk and the Fox tribes because they felt that he was not really representing their interests because he kept losing these lands in these treaties. So he had decided, kind of unilaterally, uh, he crossed the Mississippi River with about four to 500 braves to set up settlements now back on the east side of the river with the sole purpose of planting corn. So he wasn't coming back to hurt anybody. He was coming back really just to plant corn. 
And of course, once he crossed the Mississippi River and came back, it was a violation of the treaty. And the white settlers in that area were getting very nervous with 500 Indians coming back across the Mississippi River. So, you know, the, the state governors were notified and, you know, um, Illinois governor and Wisconsin governor, um, you know, they said, oh, we're gonna have to get some militia men to go and remove the Indians. They have to go back to their side of the river. And that's, that's really what it, the, the origin of it in a nutshell. And then, you know, first off, now all of a sudden someone fires a shot and then pretty soon you have an Indian uprising on your hands. And so now they have to go and fi you know, find Black Hawk, who was very shifty. He was very shifty. They had a real problem finding him. That's why every time, you know, when Lincoln's marching around, he's there, he's there, he's over here, he's everywhere, you know. And they never found him, you know. They only found, you know, evidences of him. But there was so much paranoia about where Black Hawk was that, you know, it's like the Elvis sightings. He's there, he's over here, you know. And it was the same way with Black Hawk. It took a while to, you know, to suppress it. It wasn't a long thing. It was only a matter of a few months. But, you know, it was a... Uh, and, you know... If, again, I think here's where Lincoln kind of transcends his, his environment is that, you know, he, an Indian killed his grandfather for no reason, really. And his brother uh, killed the Indian, you know. And so Lincoln didn't ha have any great feelings toward Indians in general, one way or the other. He didn't like them necessarily. I, I wouldn't say he didn't like them. He was ambivalent toward them. So he didn't hate them. He was simply doing what he was told to do, get the Indians on the other side of the river. And I have to do that, I'm a soldier. And so he goes and does his duty, you know. Now, to answer your question, I, I, I was just trying to be funny, but um, Dale Carnegie's book, Dale Carnegie thought he was a great Lincoln scholar. He wasn't, he hated Mary Lincoln. So if you read that book, you're gonna, Lincoln's life was a domestic hell and Mary Lincoln, a very nasty person, and he basically supports all of his evidence on one source. And that source happened to know Mary Lincoln and also detested her. So it's a very anti-Mary Lincoln book, although it's a very pro-Lincoln book, because at that time when he wrote it, which was in 1932, uh, you made Abraham Lincoln look that much better by making his wife look that much worse. You, he, he becomes more of a saint because she becomes more of a shrew. And that was the trend in Lincoln scholarship at that time. That's one more way we elevate Lincoln. Look what he had to deal with at home. He had to live with her, you know. And that's Dale Carnegie's book. That's why I said just bird, bird it, but you know. it's a flippant remark. I don't apologize for it, but I'm just telling you it was a flippant <laughs> remark. Okay. Yeah, one quick question. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. As a matter of fact, uh, yep. if, at the time that Lincoln was president, you hung pictures of Lincoln in your home. You know, that, that's, that, that is just a sign of absolute veneration at that time of age. You know, you, you always put Lincoln. Look at Perry Mason. He's on every courtroom and every wall in Perry Mason. It doesn't matter where you go. I always tell my daughter, I could see Lincoln's face on a postage stamp in a pasture a half a mile off. <laughs> and I can't. I can go anywhere. Oh, look at that, Lincoln, he's over there, see? You see? He's over there, he's over there. I see him on magazine stand. Whoa, look at him, he's over there. It's a sickness. It's the only way you can describe it. But I watch television shows. Oh, look at that. There's a Lincoln bust on that desk back there. You see that? Now, now you guys are going to all look for him too, right? Every time you see Lincoln on a bust, on a print, on a picture on a wall, you're going to say, oh, I wonder if Steve saw that. That's what I want you thinking about, you know? He's everywhere. But it's, it was a sign of veneration. Lincoln was the, the you know, Washington was the uh, you know, founder of our country, and Lincoln was the preserver or the savior of the country because we won the war. And they both have gone hand in hand, even in popularities of popular presidents to this day. Yeah. Okay, let us take a 10 minute break. Let's reconvene at quarter two. How's that? Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, 